scanner, asking if he can switch. He's got something going on tomorrow. Business show, how to accommodate the business. So he's going to come in to talk today. His bio's here. He's got a, a pretty uh, section on page two. And I kind of, or I'm not sorry, day two. I'm going to catch you guys a little off guard. He's got a, a pretty long bio. He's been around for a little while. Uh, but he started the uh, 3D Robotics Company. And all of their stuff is out here. Uh, if you'd like, uh, one of the things that they're doing is they're allowing people to, to test the simulator. You can find the simulator and look at their equipment and whatever else. They're also a raffle that uh, Bruce was talking about with Ricard in the hat. We're going to be doing a product at the end of this, uh, this thing. And I don't have a list of everything that's going to be given away. It's great stuff. But anyway, they, they are sponsors of this program. I did suggest that you read uh, Mr. Anderson's bio. Uh, he's an interesting guy. Anyway, please welcome Mr. Chris Anderson. Yeah, it was Thank you. And, uh, I'm so pleased that it's taking up so this whole house and so pleased you found this place and do it. I would do it every year. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is actually something previously that Chad mentioned earlier, which is the agriculture. Um, as the, uh, uh, that's like my, it's like my I'm also tapped in to it until you're ready. Uh, uh, so, uh, a little bit about our, my history. Five years ago, I was, uh, together with my routine, just to see my, my bio, I was just doing stuff with my kids, playing around with Lego and Mindstorms, robotics, trying to get them interested. Complete failure, kids are not interested in robots like Hollywood, CG, you know, Transformers, very hard to, but, you know, new lasers. Um, so I think of something you'd be interested in, I thought, what if the Lego could, like, fly a plane? That'd be awesome. And so we built a Lego autopilot, um, and a um, kitchen table, with children, and uh, it actually kind of all works. works. Uh, two things happened there. One is, I thought, that's just kind of amazing that a guy who knows nothing about this and his children who built model pilots on a kitchen table with Lego. And I thought to find out more about that, so I started to do drones on the site to uh, it's like all the be ignorant in public. When you're ignorant in public, people answer your dumb questions and then they are liberated to ask their own dumb questions. That was five years ago, and that was the, the biggest thing in the space. Um, uh, the second thing is that I, um, I realized what was going on. The reason I was able to bring my kids were able to put a you know, drum controller out of plastic toys on the dining room table is because a smartphone technology had been releasing a, you know, a, a suite of components, um, mem, mem sensors, GPS, cameras, etc., that were all moving at a faster pace than they ever moved before in history, thanks to the economies of scale of Google and Apple. And that what we now call this the piece of the that the smartphone works is that these components are now going to transform robotics and everything else. And so the same way the home group computing club and the Apple II, Steve Jobs and Boston Apple and all that started because a couple of key components in the of consumers. So I'm here today and I think many of you are as well because the same thing's happening with sensors and um, embedded processors and wireless and GPS and all that, Cam cameras. Um, I didn't know that at the time. Um, I attend to, to uh, the earlier point about guitar. It's fascinating that, uh, you know, probably Patrick, you're the first person to tell me that by, uh, by um, uh, putting our Lego autopilot code on the internet, we weaponized Lego. And that I was going to be my shoulder, but it was like just going to put on the nine year old. We were going to go over to Guantanamo and, you know, if we, we go to Christmas on the floor um, on the dining room table. Um, yeah, that, that, that was my first introduction to the absurdity of regulations. And um, I think we navigate our way here and they say for your bikes, we sell thousands of drones or we've got tens of thousands of our robots out there. We manufacture, to the point of the point earlier, speaking, we manufacture in Mexico um, and, and distribute in Mexico. Um, it's not Canada. Like Mexico, a bunch of things. Our, our codes is manufactured, quote unquote, and created by the internet. It's open source, it's created by the internet for the internet, given away for free. Uh, so the open source model is also a way to kind of navigate through some of the regulatory uh, restrictions. Um, but that's five years ago. And over those last five years, we've gone from a hobbyist to a community manager to you know, getting slightly more of the speed of some point. I was in Brisbane to come to myself and start a company. 
and um, and uh, we've done it. So at this point, you know, the drone part is kind of done. Uh, it'll get better, etc. But we've done the multi-copters and the planes and the helicopters and the autopods and the sensors and all that technology we've all built at this point. And now it's pretty robust and it's and it's, and it's very powerful and it's out there and by by many sources today. And now we're turning to the application. Was it for going from making it work to working with it? And over the past year or so, I have been having to speak, much as I did with drones in the first place, on what we think is the biggest market of all, which is, which is agriculture. Um, uh, so, you know, what is an aerial view give you? I mean, what we see here is basically that farming is a big data problem without the big data. They, we don't have, we have cameras everywhere, in our pockets, on our street corners, in our homes, in our, in our offices, but the one place we don't have cameras so it's not many densities in the skies because it's too hard, it's expensive, it's dangerous, etc. for put cameras in the skies. Now, what's interesting is if you think about it, we actually do have cameras way up in the skies in the form of satellites. And TV satellites are getting cheaper and more powerful as well. And there's this whole kind of revolution of the map satellites, which are going to make them cheaper yet. Um, but they're built in some in resolution, in cloud cover, and in the, you know, the predictability about where they're going to take. They're, they're not scheduled, easily scheduled. You can't just take any picture at any time of the satellite. They go on more or less three or four paths. Then you get to the navigation, and that's what says for agriculture has been doing today. It's Cessna's with big cameras. And they, can, they also have advantages. They're high resolution, they can get under the clouds, um, uh, they are cheaper than the satellites, um, but they're not cheap either. And then you have drones, which are cheaper than you could be flying at 100 feet. Um, and the question is we know what satellite data is good for. We know what command aircraft data is good for. The question is, what is drone data good for? From an, you know, for farms. So, um, uh, well, I, I don't think I should this, this, this video is going to play. But anyway, if any of you can see Looper, the science fiction movie, has this great scene in there that was a drone that just takes off. And I think nothing of it is except farm equipment. It's not even like, no, she just, this woman just kind of walks by. She, she sort of taps this rusty thing and it flies off and crop dusts. And I just love that because it's so banal. It's so taken for granted. And you know, to the question of like, how do we get like drones not scary? Um, if in five or ten years' time people think drones, they don't think predator or rain or fire from the skies, they think farm equipment. You know, all those, those things that buzz over cornfields. That would be awesome. That would be exactly the kind of destigmatization that I'd love to see. Um, if you go to a farm and you ask, what is it, you know, what is, it, is this typical stuff in that valley? And you ask, what sort of state of the art of sensing technology on a video net? Uh, the answer is a rose. There it is. You go to the end of the field, you get a, uh, a, 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 a that row of grapevines, you get a rose. Why do you have a rose? Um, there is a, a it, is, it is said, it's probably not even true, but it's said in those communities that the um, rose plant is vulnerable to the same fungal infections as the grape, but shows the damage record. So it's the canary in the and the idea would be that if the road starts to well, then you should look for fungal infections on the road. Uh, but it's basically a one analog pixel per row sensor. And that's like unchanged for 2,000 years. And we're not in short rows. Now, everything else is being driven by big data, but you can't stick easily with statistic sensors everywhere on crops for many reasons, among them weather, tilting, and, you know, power, and things like that. And so, in this case, we're probably going to bring the sensor to the crop. The best way to do that is with um, on, uh, autonomous aviation. Um, you know, as I say, it's big data agriculture. You can big data everything. Um, but this is one domain we really can make a huge difference. Agriculture is the biggest industry in the world. As one of the earlier speakers said, if you could, if half the inputs into agriculture, and that's water and chemicals, fertilizer, pesticides, etc., half of the inputs are wasted. Because we're spraying too much, we're spraying too little, we're spraying the wrong places, we're using too much water. Why do we do this? Because the cost of using too little is really high. The cost of missing a disease outbreak is going to be lost the entire crop. And so we prophylactically spray ahead of time. We spray fungicide in June because fungal infections happen in July. Do you have a fungal infection? Don't know. If you didn't have a fungal infection, where's the fungal infection? Don't know. You just spray everywhere to ensure it doesn't happen. What if you could? What if you could say, you know what? I'm just going to I'm going to have the drones or my fleet of small drones, swarming, um, just every day do a little, a 
little field tip there. Um, and by every reference, I'll just get that data and I'll say, do, you, do I have a fungal infection? And if the answer is no, that's great. If the answer is yes, then you'll say where, and the data will sit there, and then it's right there. And we would lower the chemical load in our ground and water in our food. And that would be a good thing from a health environment perspective, to say nothing of an economic perspective and the products that we would offer. So, um, Brandon Bassett from my, my team, who's, who's there, um, calls this a closed loop farming. For those of you who robotics, closed loop is, is, is a kind of technical term referring to this kind of feedback where, where you, you take action and then you measure the consequences of that action and then you change the action. Um, so that, that feedback loop allows you to, to precisely tailor the way you manage this farm. It's called precision agriculture. So closed loop farming, closed in the loop in farming, is simply getting sensors out there so you can see the consequences of your crop management actions. You know, the consequences of the water, the consequences of the spring, etc. So that you can, as you would with any other thing, so you wouldn't dial accordingly. You know, if your water was too much, water less. If you're spraying too much, spray less. Or if you're not spraying enough, know that too before that hot costs get too high. Um, we, you know, everyone now has got this. And if you talk to anybody in this industry, they've all identified agriculture as a big space. But figuring out exactly what kind of data is appropriate for what kind of farm and what farmer and in what frequency and at what cost is really not another question. I'm now a subscriber to Successful Farming Magazine. I, it's fascinating. I read it highly. It's like a glimpse into a world I knew nothing about a year ago. But there is the cover of Successful Farming Magazine where, where you know, last month it was precision data and you know, it was a big data and this month it's grown. So they know it. But once again, nobody's really figured out exactly what's right for every farm, every crop, everywhere. Um, the, uh, the basic thing you need to know, why is this so interesting, is, is, is basically it's got that, the biggest economic benefit, and there's the highest return on investment the ability to both move the needle on dollar terms and on kind of health and environment terms, and the lowest regulatory barriers. Two words, private land. Uh, if farmer is, no, I know I'm not going to attempt to interpret FAA regs for you, say nothing about our farming or anything like that, but as I, as, as, as many people have interpreted the commercial use aspect of the FAA regs, if you're using uh, a, a, your own equipment for your own purposes, if no money is changing hands, you're not paying for the service, uh, that is arguably not commercial use. Um, so if a farmer wants to buy a drone and use it for their own purposes, internal, you know, internal use, to help them, then on their own land, under 400 feet, visual line of sight, away from built up areas, no problems. No. You know, I could be wrong, but that's the way it looks right now. Um, and no privacy issues. All the spirit of privacy no one's concerned about, about drones flying 10 feet above the corn. There's a lot of concern about sort of drones flying 10 feet above the backyard. And so by taking the drones away from the people, and putting them onto the fields, you take a lot of those kind of social stigmas off the, off the table. Um, the design, of course, is identified as well. This is, this is their projection um, agriculture. This is their looking at the drum sales um, uh, projected to 2025. And they think it's going to be all agriculture. And I, I, I don't know whether the numbers are, are exactly right, but I think they're broadly right in, in, in direction. Um, now, you know, again, easy to say, hard to do. Um, many of us in this room, I think there are some people in this room who are really experts in agriculture. I'd love to talk to you in particular. We'd love to talk to you because we're, we're just full of questions. Um, but in general, we have this kind of cultural lapse where the technology and aerospace industries are coming with a, a solution looking for a problem. Meanwhile, the farmers of the world out there aren't really necessarily looking for technology. They just want to, you know, they just want to manage the farms more effectively. So we have, we have you know, culture clashes, and language you know, gaps, and we need to understand that a workflow, you know, what moves the needle for them as a business, um, is to be able to give them solutions that offer an immediate ROI. You know, you need to be able, it's one thing to show farmer data, it's another thing to show farmer, to tell, show farmer data they can do something with. And they should be able to see our data and they say, ah, I'm going to, tomorrow I'm going to do X differently, I'm going to water differently, I'm spray differently, or plant differently, or reap differently, or they're going to do something that needs to be actionable. And the problem is that every farmer is different in every process. What's true for tomatoes is not true for potatoes. What's true for grapes is not true for pine trees or fruit trees or wheat or, or, or you know, 
corn or anything else, every farm, every farm, every kind of farming has different needs in terms of the data or the cycles. And none of us are experts on all of them. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to work with a new community of experts in each one of those domains, find an interface, you know, an impedance match with, with a, um, you know, with a with the community that many of us have never talked to before. So I spend a lot of time talking to farmers, and Brandon spends a lot of time tromping around on uh, uh, farm fields and talking to farmers and showing them data and saying, asking questions like, what do you see? When you look at this data, what do you see? Tell me what your eyes, the farmers' eyes, see in this that's useful, surprising. What do you see that you didn't already know? Um, oops, I'm on the wrong way. Um, uh, so we, we have a conference in planes. So we basically find that we have, we have many internal debates about this, but we're trying to decide what's the right kind of doctrine in a particular field. And in our experience, and we've, now we've done enough of this kind of practical flight ops on farms, so we can tell you that um, there's no one right answer. Um, farms don't have airfields. Farms don't always have big grassy fields. Uh, farmers don't know how to fly, don't want to know how to fly. And, um, you know, and, and by the way, if you get it wrong, if you land too short or too, too far away, you're going to hit the farm, that uh, fence post, or you're going to hit the house, and all that. Um, so, uh, for many farms, the right answer is a multi-copter, some VTOL, um, you know, um, uh, aircraft. Um, but you have limited range as a result. So, like with big farms, you kind of want to go for a fixed wing. For little farms, you probably want to go for some VTOL thing, uh, multi-copter seat didn't seem to be popular. Sometimes you want video, sometimes you want photography, uh, visual photography, sometimes you want infrared, sometimes you want some combinations of the two of them. Uh, but so there is no one perfect vehicle for any of this. Uh, but what we do know is that, is that nobody wants to fly. The farmers don't want to fly if they don't have to. And so by and large, what we're looking for is one button crop guy, you know, uh, technologies and the team. My team can show you what we're doing. Uh, we, by the way, do all of these things. By the way, if you need a rover, if there's a, a rover that would be useful on the farm, we do that as well. So, you know, they, we basically feel that you need a, you need a um, uh, technology and uh, a technology platform that is agnostic as to this to the vehicle. It basically will work whatever vehicle is right for the problem. Um, you know, this is the way, this is the way that uh, you know, our mission plan you can see how it works, you can see the waypoint, you click on the maps. And typically we these days we use uh, tablets, we use Nexus 7, uh, Android tablets or, or phones. And you just sort of you just you just draw a circle. You basically draw a box around your car and off it goes and does the thing. Um, you know, the, the, the workflow looks like this. You sort of bring up your phone or tablet and you pull up your farm on, 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 on the app and you sort of draw the boundaries. You just draw the rectangle over the crop you want to manage. You then push the buttons to go. It does, it does its thing. It does a lot of work out of very short. Um, uh, you can yeah, it, uh, it control the autopilot, controls the camera, so it decides you know, when to take the pictures, uh, what direction to go, depending on the sun or the wind. Right? You can get, uh, have it um, only take pictures on in one direction, so only going this way, for example, so that the light always comes um, the same way. Uh, you can control two cameras, you can control aperture and all this kind of stuff. It's all, it's all sort of the, the normal way that you would do the precision network from the air. And then, um, and then you can do image recognition and post-processing and multi-spectral analysis and generate useful, useful data. Now, useful data in this case, it tends to be great, um, might be something like um, you have a, um, a nematode problem um, and it's these like little worms in the soil, or you have an alkali problem, it's the salt in the soil, or there's a planting problem. And in this case, the farmer typically wants to know not just what dog wants to see it, but they want like a row number. So they want a geo-reference, not a latitude and longitude, but also the, uh, the actually geo-reference to the planting, so the planting um, you know, grid that they built. And so in this case, you need to interface into the workflow software they're already using for the tractors and planters and, and beyond. So again, that's one of the things as we move past sort of you know, creating our class of drones, we're now thinking about how to interface with like John Deere technology, which turns out to be what they want. Um, it generates an example kind of grid that is auto generated and um, you know, it does that and then it, it stitches together and you know and, and so on. Um, the, the, you know, the big thing that sort of convinces farmers that this is at least interesting if not useful is to show them something they can't see with their own eyes. And typically what they're going to want is something called NDVI, which is basically the ratio of the red and the infrared. And what 
what you all need to know is that chlorophyll, the green stuff in the plants, um, healthy chlorophyll uh, reflects the infrared, you have, you know, heat, and absorbs the red, um, and turns out the energy of the plant. Unhealthy plants, where they have less chlorophyll, reflects more of the red. And so the ratio, so you get a more even ratio, the ratio of the infrared to the red is more as close to one for unhealthy. And so what you do is you just do that calculation. Now there's lots of ways to do that calculation. You can, you can take two cameras, you can do one camera with two different passes. The way you get the infrared, the near infrared, is either you can use you can go for a full infrared camera, all the way to long wave infrared, that's quite expensive. Uh, or you can just actually take a regular camera and take out the infrared filter that's on the camera to make it to make it see the way our nose on that moment I see, and instead put it in a blue filter in there. And that would give you an near infrared image for the same camera. And so one of the experiments that my other colleague John Jovini, who's in the back somewhere, uh, right over there, has, has done is, is actually uh, use a, an inexpensive 3D camera, which has you know, two lenses, and just convert one of them to infrared, and the other one is visual. And you have to take two pictures at the same time, and then you can do that subtraction in, 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 in software um, that creates the MVI. And when you do that, you end up with this. You end up with a, uh, an image of a crop that a farmer can't see for himself. The red here is unhealthy, damaged plants, the green is healthy. Now they knew that around the road, the tractor runs, there's crop damage. Um, and they probably knew about some of this, but you know, in the middle of the farm, you know, like, like like right there, they may not have known about that. Um, and they may they certainly can't see it as easily as this with their eyes. Um, so, you know, just be able to tell the farmer that, that you know, they want to nose their, their crop, they can walk their crop, but they don't have multi spectral sensors in their head. And by simply showing them that they have a view of their own crop they haven't seen before, you know, the, the beginnings of the conversation which can learn to act, lead to actual information. Um, I, the problem for those of us who are not farmers is that, you know, it's really hard to look at crops and see something that's for ourselves. They're very homogeneous. You know, something like this looks useful to me, and that's a salt image, by the way. I don't know if you can see it, but, you know, what we have here is, um, this is salt image, but and farmers probably knew there was this kind of halo of additional sort of set of salt image because the salt leaches into the soil and spreads um, through a capillary reaction. But did they know about the second halo around that and the third halo around that? So that's kind of, that, that's the thing where although the farmer's eyes can see the damage, when you pull back and see it from the sky, it's useful. It's, it's a far as the other farmer may not already have themselves. You don't even need multi for that. Um, uh, this is another example of something where a simple visualizer helps with, with um, grapes. Um, there's, you know, they, they're often on hilly soil. Grapes and wine is basically just a, the grapes are a vehicle to get the soil into, into the product, into the wine itself. It's all the flavor of the soil, the nature of the soil. And so there isn't so much the bad soil, the good soil is just different. And what the farmers want to know is that as long as they plant different, different kinds of grapes on different soil, um, but what they, you know, I don't know if you can see on this one, but in that top bit, there, this is our, our, our friends up in uh, Sonoma, um, uh, around a couple of different wines on top of it. You can see it's dark green than the bottom bit. But, you know, a farmer will also see it in the middle of it if it's even darker green. Now, that's not bad, it's just different. And so, what Ryan's thinking about doing, when he saw this data, um, uh, he said, you know what we could do? We could um, take a picker, tell the pickers to um, wear these phones on their arms, and their phones, and we're going to create a geofence. We're going to create a, 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 a GPS boundaries, and just tell the pickers that when they cross the GPS boundary from the lighter from the lighter green to the darker green, they just put the grapes in a different bucket. And this gives them a higher precision granularity of the wine and the grapes. And this allows them to differentiate themselves as being a more and more distinguished, differentiated wine. And so it's, that's, not, that's an example of it's been using the data to have a more distinct wine that they can use as marketing. And, and by the way, I'll be completely honest about this. Right now, a lot of farmers use things are just using this for bragging rights. They're A, they, they use things that they think is cool. B, they use things that they're curious. A few of them have found useful 
utility business. And some of them are just doing it because it's awesome marketing for companies, for farmers that pride themselves and market their product as being very, very high precision. Now these are early days, and over time it's going to have to get more useful than that. But that has been, that's been you know, a, a, a non-trivial reason for some of these farmers to help us to get involved. Um, this is another example uh, of some uh, crop data uh, from uh, grapes. Uh, you can see that dark green patch in the middle. That's uh, an ancient stream, the alluvial soil from an ancient stream. Again, not necessarily good or bad, just different. Uh, but this right here, that's an irrigation leak. leak. Um, and that's a problem. That's something they may or may not have known about and they can solve it. It's like, oh, I'm going to go fix that right now. So that's that. Um, from a, from a kind of technology perspective, the image processing, which is typically done by stitching together um, uh, images, looking at feature recognition, it's really hard for farmers because they all, all these crops look alike. Uh, and so, you know, where do you find the features? I mean, as farming gets more homogeneous and the farms get bigger and the planting is more automated, the, the features, the differentiating features, become fewer and fewer. And so, typically, what we have to do is look at many other things like this and you know, how you stitch it together and crops that look like that. And so, the answer is uh, the next thing that companies like ours are doing is really focusing on georeferencing the data, embedding the high precision attitude and GPS data from the autopilots into the exit files of the, of, the, of the images so that they can steer the image processing um, algorithms to stitch things together more accurately without having to depend entirely on feature recognition. And in addition, once you do that and you highlight a problem area, you can then tell a farmer exactly where it is. And they either, either, either link it into their existing farm farm planning software and tell them what grid or road number, or you just go to the lab and they can take their iPhone out there and find it directly. But this sort of georeferencing of data um, allows you to do much more, much more high precision data, much better data analysis in terms of more actionable information for the farmer. And so when you look at all the innovation that we're now doing and others in our field are doing, it's, it's not really on the drones themselves anymore. It's all about the payload the image acquisition and the image processing that comes after the fact. Whether that's a product or a service is an opportunity for, for people like uh, everyone like in this room. Uh, ultimately, it starts with asking farmers you know, the important question, what do you want? What, what do you want to see that's going to change the way you farm? And so I wish I could tell you to get all the right code now. Instead, my message to you is, you know, if you're not already doing it, go out on the farms and start talking to farmers, show them pictures, you know, understand their language because ultimately that's what the business is going to be. All right, thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions? Are you and maybe you could, uh, some of the people on uh, the screen can hear the audience, maybe you could repeat your questions. Yeah. Um, two quick questions. Uh, do you have any data on you? Open source technology for the stitching, and yeah. your company is obviously well known for doing open source stuff. Are you actually sharing all this stuff and yeah. this technology with other people? Uh, I'll answer the second one first. Um, so all of, our, all of our software is open source, but we don't actually create our own solution software. There's lots of open source software out there. Brandon and that's right behind you can tell you to tell you a lot about this. You can use Microsoft Ice, you can use PT GUI. Um, Brandon, what's the one that you're using right now? Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft, I'm not sure that's open source. Uh, source. Not open source. Uh, but there's, there's lots of stitching software out there. I think what, what is, is now what we're working on and others are working on are kind of workflow solutions, which is ways to kind of massage the data, get it into the stitching software, so the stitching software can do a better job. So things like injecting um, uh, attitude and GPS data into the EXIF, um, uh, filtering out bad photos, um, ordering the photos in ways that, that are helpful, and that's stuff that we'll be releasing um, in an open source as well. But by the way, we're totally, our license allows anybody, if anybody wants to take the software, uh, modify it, and create some commercial alternative, um, you know, that's, that's awesome. We all can be a great platform, so it's a completely open platform, but you, can, you don't have to use our code, our code is open source, but you can work with our code through APIs scripts and all sorts of open interfaces to create proprietary solutions that you can solve for whatever price you want. So I think it's a great opportunity for people. 
Um, your, your, your other question was about who do we have to demonstrate ROI? Uh, yeah, yield improvement. Yeah, I wish I had a good answer for you. Do we have an anecdote? Um, you know, we have not had a full um, uh, harvesting cycle to get an ROI. We tell people they say, oh, I, you know, I, I'll, I have to pay this guy like, you know, you know, 200 bucks an hour to walk my field. Um, if I could fly my field for zero bucks an hour, that would be, that would be great. Whether the drone is a full replacement for an expert obviously the drone must walk in the field, I don't think there is. But that kind of economic thinking the farmers go through. Um, yeah, these should raise uh, quick question for you. Generally, when you talk about the data, one of the things you notice is data data and you use a map for the core data science, and off comes some correlations. Do we have enough data using drones so we can actually have this correlation? So we still haven't found a whole bunch of those things because we don't have the data. Is that right? Uh, I didn't quite hear the So you guessed the correlations between the data and. So the first thing is in, in data science, you get enough data to actually right. create correlations. The data we have here in agriculture and using drones is we haven't collected enough data so we can actually start to write.